So we've got three speakers um, this afternoon. Um, first of all, we have um, Jack Betteridge, who's going to tell us about um, cleaning up distributed objects in managed languages and applications in extremely large scale simulations. So um, I will pass the microphone to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, an incredibly long title. Essentially, how I am the parallel bin man for HPC applications. Uh, so this is uh, joint work I've been doing with Patrick Farrell at Oxford and David Hamm at Imperial. Um, and just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So um, what are managed languages and, and why are we using them? Um, what we mean by a distributed object? And finally, what we're doing uh, to clean these up? Um, so starting with managed languages. So a, a programming language that uh, is uh, automatically allocating and deallocating memory for you. So we've got a few examples up there, popular ones, Python, Julia, R, and then MATLAB, Java, these, these sort of things. These are what we call uh, a managed language. Uh, and they have some real advantages. This is why we, we really want to be able to use them even on um, uh, the HPC side of things. So the pros are, you know, they're, they're, they're high level, so you're not tweaking around at the, the low level and doing tiny little loop optimizations. They're, I've put it in quotes here, easy to develop in, so they're, they're perceived to be easy, easier languages to, for people to use, so um, you don't need to be a technical expert to, to write code in them. And the, the, one of the key advantages is fast prototyping. And this is wonderful. You can, you can write a bit of code, you can try it out, and if it doesn't work, you can just tweak it around. You don't have to wait for it to compile each time. And the, the key advantage of it being managed is you don't have to explicitly manage the memory. Uh, and then some sort of perceived cons of, of these, they, they often lead to slower performance, so they don't run as fast as a compiled piece of code. Um, and you lose the control over, the, the fine grain control over uh, memory allocation, deallocation, so you can't make these, these tiny, tiny optimizations that you can in a compiled language. Um, so why use them if they've got the, these cons? Um, so I'm working with, um, with PDEs. So uh, state-of-the-art state, state of the art implementation for a continuum mechanic simulation in, requires an incredible investment in um, person years of, of development. It's got loads of testing, and it only really solves one problem. Um, so the cost is prohibitive if you're just in an emerging research area. Um, you actually need leading expertise in all sorts of different areas from things like mesh generation, discretizations, um, solvers, and then finally sort of at the HPC level for optimizing and running these simulations. Uh, and then the result is that the software is actually incredibly complex um, and then very difficult to maintain, so it leads to things like bit rot. Um, so we take the, the view that um, we can uh, manage this through a separation of concerns, so we compose diff together different software components, and we harness things like the power of DSLs, uh, which are in managed languages. So, what is FireDrake? So, FireDrake is as the um, piece of code that I helped uh, I developed for. Um, it's an automated system for the solution of partial differential equations using the finite element method and code generation, and this allows us to have the best of both worlds. We're going to have uh, the high-level interface at Python, uh, where you can write and express your problem, um, but the code generation then allows us to have the performance like a compiled language like C, uh, and access to solver libraries like Petsy. So, just a quick uh, look around the room. Has anyone actually used FireDrake before? Just a few. Well, that's great, because I can give my sales pitch. Right? So <laughs> on the left-hand side, you've got a, a mathematical description of a problem. So this is uh, Poisson's equation. We're going to solve it in a unit cube domain. Um, we can use continuous finite elements, degree three. We've got zero boundary conditions, a complicated mathematical function on your right-hand side, and finally, the, the weak form of the, of the PDE. And you can see, over on the right, you've got the, the actual genuine code that you write in FireDrake. And this is kind of our party piece, is that it all fits on, on the slide. That's, that's it. That's everything. Um, and you, you might be looking at that. Oh, OK, yeah, that's fine if you're just running it on your, your laptop. No, this is genuinely the code that you can take away. And you can, yes, you can run it on your, your laptop and do the rapid prototyping we were talking about before. But this is also the code that you can take and run on the HPC cluster 
as well. Um, and I don't need to explain too much how, because we had several talks before, how much the HPC landscape is changing. So previously, and it's a long time ago now, FireDrake was running on about a third of the old national supercomputer, Archer. Um, and that's sort of when, when I started um, developing for FireDrake team. Uh, and through the, so the past few years, we've been moving it to, to different uh, architectures um, and trying to, trying to get it to, to scale. So you can see the modern trends here. You've got inc slowly increasing uh, CPU counts, increasing memory um, and memory bandwidth, but things like memory bandwidth per core is decreasing. So there's a lot of these um, architecture-specific things that are changing. And this is one of the wonderful things about uh, FireDrake is you can optimize at the algorithm level. You don't have to go away and completely rewrite your entire code base if you are changing something like the discretization where you might have to with a completely bespoke solution. Anyway, this isn't a FireDrake talk, but I thought I'd give you the, the quick pitch for that. Um, so now I'm going to move on and talk about what distributed objects are. So the, the relevance of this is um, in FireDrake, um, we would find our code occasionally hanging when we're using uh, using FireDrake in parallel. And this was happening more frequently the more MPI ranks that we were using. And this would happen non-deterministically. Uh, and we, we tracked the problem down eventually to this interplay between uh, Petsy, which is our solver library, the Petsy for Pi, uh, distributed objects, and Python's internal memory management. Um, so things like uh, Monte Carlo simulations, multi-level Monte Carlo simulations, big simulations, uh, and multi-grid simulations, they require lots and lots of instances of these Petsy for Pi objects, so things like a solver instance or a vector object, um, object or um, a matrix. And these are all created at the very high Python level, um, but the underlying memory, the memory that we're holding on to, was in C, it was in pet C at the C level. Um, so I'll just take a moment to, to define what I'm going to mean by a distributed object for the rest of the talk, which is a block of memory that exists simultaneously across all the ranks in your simulation. And importantly, it has synchronized creation and destruction uh, steps, and the coordination is managed with MPI. Right, so as I said, being Python-based, FireDrake's ob objects and Petsy for Pi objects uh, are all subject to Python's memory management. So not, it's not controlled by C like it is in, in Petsy, for instance. Um, so you've got these three competing forces. You've got the Petsy objects, which are um, distributed objects. So they're collectively created and destroyed. Um, you've got the Python garbage collector, which is not MPI aware. So has no idea that several instances are running your simulation across a cluster. And the third one, which really um, messes up our simulations, is the, the Python garbage collector is not deterministic. There are lots of different factors that determine when the garbage collector is called. It's not called on all ranks at the same time. So if your ranks aren't calling the garbage collector at the same time, the result is deadlock. So how are we going to sort this out? So I'm going to go through exactly how Python normally cleans up. Um, memory. Um, so there's two types of garbage collection. There is reference counting garbage collection. I'll go through that in a minute. But essentially, you keep track of the number of references you have to a piece of memory. And when that count goes to zero, it's no longer accessible. So it's safe to go away and clean it up. But there's also the generation or, or cyclic garbage collector which periodically searches for reference cycles, and we'll go through what that means in a minute, uh, and tries to break them to clean up that memory. Uh, and it's the, the latter that is non-deterministic. So we don't actually have problems with the reference counting garbage collector, just the cyclic garbage collector. And so I've got a bit of code there that we'll go through in the next few slides. So reference counting. So we're keeping track of the number of references here, and I've got some code highlighted to show you what's going on. So in this first line, I'm going to create a reference to my object. In the next line, we're going to create another reference to it. And notice that the reference count that is highlighted over there in blue has gone up by one. Now, if we delete x, the reference count is decremented. Um, but there's still a reference 
um, which Y is holding to it. And then if we finally delete Y, the reference count has gone to zero, and Python is free to clean it up. Ta-da. Right, so now let's run this on my four core computer and see what happens. So we're keeping track of the reference above the code in each rank. So we create a reference to my object, which is X. We have another reference, which is Y. Delete one reference, delete the other. And then importantly, all four ranks are now going to clean up at the same time. So what happens if we create a reference cycle? So I've got a bit of code here that you can uh, inspect at your leisure, uh, which creates a reference cycle. So we create the object B, and you can see in the diagram on the side what's happening. And then we make that a cyclic reference here by uh, assigning the object to uh, one of the internal attributes. So now we have a reference cycle. And even though we delete the reference to the object, you can see the reference count in neither case has dropped to zero. So if it was up to the reference counting garbage collector, this object would never be cleaned up. Um, but we have the cyclic garbage collector, which will. But what happens on multiple ranks? We now have our reference cycle. So Python is free to call the reference, uh, the cyclic garbage collector. But as I mentioned before, is non-deterministic. So it's going to clean up on some ranks and not on others. So now if your object is one of these distributed objects, which needs collective creation and destruction, you're going to end up with a deadlock. But this, this doesn't really happen in real life. I've I made this, I constructed this example just to prove a point. No, actually it turns out one of the very fundamental objects that we need for our continuum mechanic simulations, a mesh, well, this has an attribute which is a coordinate, and that coordinate is of class coefficient. Now, a coefficient has to live in a function space. Okay, so we'll make that. But a function space has to belongs on a, with a mesh, and the natural choice of mesh is the original one that we're forming the problem on. So all of a sudden, this very fundamental structure that we're using in our simulation is a reference uh, cycle. And this was pointed out to us by one of our users and said, look, I've got this issue where I can create a mesh, mesh and it is, it's deadlocking. I mean, this is fairly artificial code. We're really forcing uh, the garbage collector to go into this unbalanced state. But it's a real problem, and it does arise naturally when you're doing these very large simulations. Um, so what's happening here? I've gone down to two cores, two, two ranks here to, to make it a bit easier to demonstrate. So in, uh, on rank zero, we'll go into this loop here. So we're creating the mesh, but we're not storing a reference. So there's one item in the garbage. Uh, and that's the, the uh, it has the reference cycle as we discussed in the previous slide. Uh, now if we're rank zero, let's go and make a load of empty objects, not store any references and fill up the garbage. And then rank zero wants to clean up. Rank one is ready to, to move on to the next instruction. But because the cleanup on rank zero includes this uh, object with the reference cycle, we end up with deadlock because rank one isn't ready to call the cyclic garbage collector yet. So I think I've got about a few, a few minutes left to discuss what the actual solution is. I always tend to stretch out the first bit and forget to, you know, this is the important bit where we talk about how we solve the problem. So our solution to this is to, um, when a Petsy for Pi object, so this one of these parallel distributed objects is created, we're going to read a creation index from the communicator. So these, these things uh, that exist in parallel will have to have a communication, communicator, uh, and you're free to stash attributes on that communicator. So we're going to have a creation index that we're going to increment each time we create a distributed object and associate that object with this creation index. Um, and then when the object is destroyed, we will duplicate the object header, and store a pointer to that header in a dictionary, so that you could think of this as a Python dictionary, if you like, or a hash map um, in Petsy. And that is also one of these things that is stored on the communicator. So it's always asso associated with the communicator that the object is created on. And then we hand the original header back to Python so it can be destroyed. Um, and this, importantly, this, uh, this destruction step is done non-collectively. So this can be called from within Python. Um, and because we're not calling Petsy's destroy routine yet, we're duplicating it and, and waiting. 
um, we can call these um, whenever on any rank. But the problem, of course, here is that these objects are now building up on each rank and not being destroyed. So we're going to have to go away and destroy them. And we have to do this bit collectively. So the solution is at some predetermined point in the future in our code, we will have some sort of barrier that goes through and destroys all these objects building up on all these ranks. And to do that, we go and get the, this garbage hash map, this dictionary of all the previously destroyed objects um, that, that we have on a communicator. We sort through the keys. Now, these keys, if you remember, the creation index. So when we created the, the, the distributed object initially, it was assigned a creation index. And we sort them into the correct order. Intersect across all ranks. So we're making sure we've got the same set of uh, creation indices on each rank. And then in the right order, we go through and destroy all the objects that have all been destroyed across all ranks collectively so that we don't end up in a deadlock. Uh, and this is just a quick sort of initial performance graph to show. So the graphs on the left are showing the previous situation where we just use Python's garbage collector. And the important thing to say about this is it's not a correct solution. So we're really comparing our performance here against something that's uh, not a correct implementation of anything. Um, but to show that we aren't suffering too much of a performance penalty by doing this um, parallel garbage collection, on the right, we've got uh, the same, uh, exactly the same simulation with our new cleanup routine in there. And you might be actually surprised to see that the cleanup is faster, but this is because the parallel garbage collection is now happening at C in pet C rather than relying on the Python interpreted um, garbage collect cyclic garbage collection that's included there. Um, so we aren't paying too much of a penalty for uh, doing this, this additional step. So just a few conclusions. Um, so we're, why would we want to use the managed language for simulation on HPC? Well, it's flexible. And through code generation, things like FireDrake, you can still get the same performance. Uh, and it is easy to optimize at the much higher algorithmic level rather than uh, right at, down at the low level. Um, and we can also do things like tailor the algorithm to compute resources available. So by, again, by using this um, high level representation of our problems, um, we can have Fidrake installed on multiple different CPU architectures um, and still maintain things like performance portability. Um, and then in the future, we can look at things like targeting uh, accelerators and that sort of thing um, just by manipulating the algorithm and the solvers rather than rewriting the whole code base. Uh, and then we've hopefully shown in this presentation that the, the lack of fine-grained memory control in a managed manage language is not an issue any longer with these changes. So it's still possible to have distributed objects um, in a simulation, and that actually the, the parallel cleanup that you perform doesn't really impact on performance. I thought I'd bring this, this along as well to sort of say, actually, hopefully this is a, a useful thing to bring to the attention of the, the community because I feel like actually um, there's a lot more use of uh, Python in HPC. And if you are interested in, in knowing more, please come and uh, come down and talk to me because I'll be very interested in other use cases for this. So we've, we've only really done this in Petsy and Petsy for Pi, um, but I think there is probably a more general use case for this sort of garbage cleanup. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. I'll just get the slider up um, so we can uh, have a look at the questions and then we'll play um, microphone swap over. So um, top question there is, I'm not quite sure whether the Fire Drake is a library to do finite ele element analysis or not. If yes, does it have the capability to, solve, to do the crack growth simulation? Uh, that's a very good question. So uh, yes, it is. It's a, a finite uh, element library. Um, I think this question is possibly better answered by some of my colleagues who, who work on the, um, the simulation side, but do come and uh, have a, a conversation with me. I can put, probably put you in, in 
uh, context. But we do have uh, applications in things like seismology, glaciology. So um, come and talk to us, and hopefully we can find a way to you know, run your simulation in FireDrake. Thank you. Uh, I ask this question because I have the background of the FEA, and sometimes I need to create my own shape function and uh, the, the constitute equations inside. So is this flexible to extend to, to create my own element, or I need to use the default interface to connect with follow sign standard, or yeah? Um, so, so the answer to your question is, it's, I wouldn't say it's easy to put new elements in, but FireDrake is one of the few finite element frameworks out there that supports a very, very wide range of finite elements. So if you've seen this periodic table of finite elements, we're trying to basically um, implement all of them. Uh, and if you have a use case for a particular finite element, I think it's, it's fair to say the FireDrake developers would happily work with you to actually implement it not um, because we don't think you're capable of doing it, but actually we think that uh, having these finite elements available would benefit other people. So there's some very exotic finite elements in FireDrake, and I urge you to try it out. OK, the next question is, can't you just destroy the objects and the components in the first place to stop the cycles happening? Uh, destroy them in the first place. Oh, I see. So this is uh, outside of our control. So this is these are reference cycles occurring, um, ca can also occur just in Petsy for Pi itself. Um, so we are, um, and, and as you saw, these cycles also arise very naturally. So you could sort of code your way out of it, but then you have to make sure you're not taking advantage of these um, natural structures uh, that, that exist. So I think the answer is, you, you could, but that's not the, the approach that we, we want to take. And um, I think we've probably just got time for one more question before we finish up. So how implementation version dependent is your solution? Uh, so the solution for the um, garbage collection, I don't think is um, particularly dependent on any version of, I mean, I guess the question is the implementation of, of, of what and the version of what. I think that the implementation could be completely abstracted out and actually I'm looking into making it uh, an add-on module for MPI for Pi, because I feel like this is one of the places where it would, would naturally crop up. So I, I don't think it, it is dependent on a particular version. I mean, the only comment there would be, it wouldn't be dependent on a version of Petsy that didn't have these reference cycles but that's, that's sort of a trivial answer. Um, and if that's the last question, I'm happy to answer any other questions afterwards if you come and find me. Great, can we thank Jack once more, please?